The Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept a great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a man who rose from a watery grave to accuse the living of his murder. A tale titled... You only die once. Here is the tale, You Only Die Once, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. The story begins some years ago in the beautiful Winthrop Mansion on the Hudson River. It is early evening, and John Winthrop, just home from the city, enters the drawing room to find his wife, Vivian, reading a telegram... Good evening, darling. Who's the telegram from? Oh, John, it's from my brother, Jerry. He's arriving tonight from Los Angeles. His train gets into Grand Central at 10 o'clock. Well, that's fine. I'm very anxious to meet your brother, darling. Oh, John, you'll love him. Jerry's a grand person. I'm sure he is, Vivian, if he's anything like his sister. Oh, for that, you deserve a kiss. <laughs> oh, John, I'm so excited about Jerry's visit. Well, having Jerry here makes you so happy. We'll have to make his stay a permanent one. Come on, darling, let's go to dinner. Mr. Norton is here, sir. Hello, Jerry. Come in. I'm John, your brother-in-law. Hello, John. <gasps> Jerry. Oh, Jerry. Oh, it's so good to see you again. Well, stand back and let me look at the bride. Vivian, I've never seen you looking so beautiful. Now, John, you know why I'm so fond of Jerry. Oh, Jerry, dear, what suddenly made you decide to come east? You said nothing about it in your last letter. Well, you know your brother, always making quick decisions. I gave up my position in Los Angeles to come east. I, uh, well, I intend to settle down and find a job in New York. In New York? Mm -hmm. Oh, Jerry, that's wonderful. John, did you hear that? Yes, darling, and I think it's a fine idea. As I recall, Jerry, Vivian said you were an executive. That's right. Well, then, I think I've got you a position. You mean you know of an opening? Or with whom? Myself. You? Yes. For the past week or so, I've been contemplating hiring an assistant. My doctor told me I was overworking and needed one. Oh, there's nothing seriously wrong with you, I hope. No, no. Just that my heart aches up a bit now and then when I've been working too hard. Well, what do you say, Jerry? Will you accept the position? All right, John. And I'll do my best to be of real assistance to you. No, oh, you don't know how happy this all makes me. John, uh, do you think Jerry might come here and live with us? I think that's an excellent idea, if Jerry is agreeable. Well, there's nothing I'd rather do, but, uh, <laughs> well, are you sure I, I won't be in the way? Oh, Jerry, of course not. John and I would love to have you live with us. Of course we would. All right, then. And thank you both very much. Good. Then it's all settled. Well, I must be off to bed. It's almost midnight, and I promised my doctor I'd be in bed every night by 11. I'll be up shortly, John. Oh, take your time, Vivian. I'm sure you two have a good deal to talk over. Good night, Jerry. Good night, John. <laughs> well, sis, how have you been? Oh, darling, if you only knew how much I've missed you these past months. Well, aren't you even going to kiss me? Of course, darling. Mm. Oh, darling, I've waited a long time for that. It seems years. It's only been six months. How have you been doing, darling? Not bad. Not bad at all. See this diamond bracelet? 
It was my wedding present from John. What else have you gotten? Two other bracelets, a necklace, and four rings. What's it all worth? Amounts to a little over a hundred thousand. Hmm, not bad, considering you've only been married three months. Oh, how much longer will I have to go on keeping up the act, though, Jerry? Never give up a gold mine until it's played out. And unless I miss my guess, John is still good for plenty more. He's a very rich man. Exactly. So you and I are staying here until we've worked, John, for every cent you can get. Then when the time is ripe, you'll sue for a divorce and a big cash settlement. A few months went by. Months in which John Winthrop found himself increasingly happy. Vivian was all that he'd ever dreamed of in a wife. And Jerry, as his business assistant, was invaluable. In his happiness, John lavished gifts on his wife and paid Jerry an exceedingly handsome salary. The three lived in complete harmony until one night, one night late in September. Is that you, Jerry? Yes. How are you, uh, sis? In seventh heaven. Jerry, why didn't you tell me John was leaving for Chicago tomorrow morning? Well, he didn't make up his mind until late this afternoon at the office. Uh, where is he now? He's looking high and low for some papers in a brown envelope. Oh, it must be the Anderson papers he wants. I have them right here in this briefcase. So where is he? I'll give them to him. He's up in your room. Up in my room? Yes, when he couldn't find the papers in the study, he went upstairs to see if they were in your desk. In my desk? Yes. Jerry, is anything wrong? I don't know. Let me see. Did I lock my desk this morning before I left for the office, or didn't I? What difference does it make? What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. If he should... You seem to be quite upset, Jerry. Is it because you were afraid I found your desk unlocked that I might come across these? So, you found them, huh? Yes. What do you have there, John? Merely some newspaper clippings, Vivian. Allow me to read you a couple. The first one is dated five years ago, and it's from a New Orleans paper... Underneath a picture of Jerry and you, it reads, Mr. and Mrs. Philip Gordon, <gasps> arrested for $10,000 jewelry theft at Mardi Gras party. Where did you get that clipping? I found it, along with several others in Jerry's, or should I say Philip's desk. Oh. Allow me to read you another clipping. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Gordon, who pleaded guilty to the $10,000 Mardi Gras jewel theft, were today sentenced to prison by Judge Sawyer. Philip Gordon received a sentence of three to I five... I don't want to hear any more. Stop it, you hear? It was very clever of you two to pretend to be brother and sister when actually you were man and wife. No doubt sometime in the future, Vivian was to divorce me and receive a handsome cash settlement. Yes, that's right. We had planned that. But our plans seem to have been spoiled. What do you intend doing? I am not going to Chicago tomorrow morning. Instead, I'm going to see my attorney and prosecute you both to the full extent of the law. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were yes, you. Yes, John, think of your reputation and your family name. They'd be dragged in the mud if this ever came out. You wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? You think you can blackmail me into silence, don't you? No, you're wrong. Come what may, I'm going to see to it that you're both punished. I... Uh, oh, Jerry, he seems uh, ill. Yes, he does, doesn't he? I'm, I'm perfectly all right. I think we've said... Everything that's to be said. I'm through with words now. First thing in the morning, I'm going to see my attorney and have you both exposed. You're going to learn you you made a fool of the wrong man. And now to continue the story, you only die once, as it is written in the sealed book. After John had gone to bed, Jerry silently paced up and down the drawing room, trying to figure a way out of their dilemma. Vivian watched him anxiously, her face pale and drawn. If John goes to his attorney in the morning, it'll mean stiff prison sentences for the two of us. You can be sure of that. Jerry, I couldn't stand going to prison again. To be separated from you, if they send me to prison, I, I'll die. You know how I feel, darling, the same way. There's only one way out. One way out? Yes. We must see to it that John doesn't go to his attorney in the morning. Jerry, you don't mean... Oh, no, Jerry, no. If we don't get rid of him, it'll mean prison. Do you prefer that? Oh, no, no, but I'm so afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. I have a scheme, a scheme that can't miss if we play our cards right. Are you sure? Positive. 
The best thing about it is its simplicity. What is this scheme of yours? John's gun is in that desk over there. I'll use it to get rid of him. Once that's done, you and I will carry him down to the boathouse. To the boathouse? Yes. There I'll fasten some weights securely to the body. Then we'll take him out in the launch to the deepest part of the river and drop him in. The weights will take him to the bottom and keep him there. But, Jerry, in a few days they'll start looking for him. They'll drag the river. They'll start looking for him, but they won't drag the river. For as far as the police are concerned, John will have gone to Chicago. But, but how are you going to make them believe that? It's very simple. I have here John's ticket on the 6.30 train tomorrow morning for Chicago. After we've disposed of the body, you'll drive me to Grand Central Station. We're out board the train as John Winthrop. Oh, but Jerry, you could never pass as John. You're, you're so much younger. Nonsense. John and I are about the same height and build. If I were to wear John's glasses and a false mustache, in the early morning light, no one would notice the difference. But you wouldn't actually go to Chicago, would you? Of course not. After I'd made sure that I was seen by the conductor and the porter at the station, I'd, uh, I'd secretly slip off the train at the first stop. Oh, I see. A few days later, we'd notify the police that John had gone to Chicago and we were worried as we hadn't heard from him. They'd naturally check to see if he'd taken the train. The uh, conductor and porter would satisfy them on that score. The police would begin a nationwide search. But, darling, they'll ask questions, hundreds of questions. All we have to say is that you drove John to Grand Central Station and watched him leave on the train to Chicago. Stick to that story and we're safe, do you understand? Oh, yes, Jerry. Remember, that's all you know. John got the 6.30 train for Chicago, and that was the last you saw of him. All right, darling. I, I won't slip up. That's the spirit. Now, it's just 11 o'clock. We'll wait two hours to give John a chance to fall asleep. At 1 o'clock, we'll go up to his room and do what must be done. <laughs> You all set, Vivian? Yes. I'll open the door. Quiet now. He's sound asleep. Yes. Just hold that flashlight steady. Oh, hurry, darling, hurry. Steady, Vivian. <laughs> Quiet. Well, it's all over. Jerry, is, is he dead? Yes. He never knew what happened. Why, I'm glad he didn't wake up. I'm so glad he was sound asleep. Now, you pick him up by the feet... Well, I get him under the shoulders. The next stop for John is the boathouse. The river's the deepest just about 50 yards from here, Jerry. Then that's the place for us. Cut the motor when we reach it. We're just about there, Jerry. I'll cut the engine and we'll drift the rest of the way. You'll have to give me a hand with him, Vivian. With these weights around him, he's quite heavy. All right. What do you want me to do? You take his feet while I take him by the shoulders. And when I give the word, we'll both lift and toss him over the side. You ready? Yes. Then lift. Oh, Jerry, he's so heavy. Just a little more. That's it. Now, I'll drop him. There. <sighs> Well, darling, that's the last of Mr. John Winthrop. Now we'd better be getting back to shore. There's still quite a bit that remains to be done. Keep your hat pulled down and your collar up, Jerry. Right. Uh, pardon me, conductor, but can you tell me where my compartment is? Uh, the name is Winthrop. John Winthrop. Uh, you have your ticket, Mr. Winthrop? Uh, you have it, don't you, darling? Oh, yes, here it is, conductor. Now, let's see. Car 3476. That's this car right here. You just go aboard. The porter will show you your compartment. Thank you, conductor. That's quite all right, Mr. Winthrop. I think we can count on him to remember I got on this train. I'll pick you up at the 125th Street station. Right. I'll wait there till you arrive. Goodbye, John. Take care of yourself. I will, Vivian. I'll phone you tomorrow night from Chicago. Don't forget, John. I won't. Bye. Here. 
Here I am, Jerry. Come on, let's get in the car and away from here. All right. Did everything go all right? Perfectly. After the train pulled out of Grand Central, I had the porter show me to my compartment. I told him I hadn't slept for 24 hours, and I uh, I didn't want to be disturbed until we reached Chicago. You didn't forget to give him a tip, did you? No. I gave him a $5 tip, just as we'd planned. Don't worry, that porter will remember me. Good. You're certain no one saw you slip off the train just now? Well, I'm positive. I just I took off my disguise before I left the compartment. And everything's working out just as I planned. Now, all we have to do is sit tight for a few days. Then why are the men in Chicago who had appointments with John? When they tell us that John never kept his appointments, we'll get in touch with the police. And with tears in your eyes, you'll beg the police to find your uh, missing husband. And now to continue the story. You only die once, as it is written in the sealed book. Following Jerry's plan, two days after John's death, Vivian notified the police that her husband was missing. Shortly afterwards, she was called on by Lieutenant Richards of the Missing Persons Bureau. You say, Mrs. Winthrop, the last you saw of your husband was when he boarded the train for Chicago? Yes, Lieutenant. I waved to him as the train pulled out of the station... That was the last time I saw him. A week passed, and then two. But the police found no trace of John Winthrop. It was as though he had vanished off the face of the earth after he had boarded the train for Chicago. The noted financier was reported seen in half a dozen cities all over the country, but... Each report turned out to be false. The newspapers played up the strange disappearance of John Winthrop, but, but after he had been missing a week, the story lost its interest for the public and was quickly forgotten. When two weeks had passed, Jerry took Vivian, who was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, away for a rest. Making no secret of their destination, they went to John's Mountain Lodge, high in the Adirondacks. Would you like a cocktail, Vivian? Yes, Jerry. Oh, darling, isn't it wonderful being up here, just the two of us? It lacks only one thing to be perfect, music. Let there be music and let the wine flow freely. <laughs> I'll turn on the radio. Here's looking at you, baby. And here's to our good luck. May we always have it. <laughs> oh, we're sitting pretty. Someday the police are going to give up looking for John. And then you're going to become a very, very wealthy widow. Do you really think so, Jerry? <laughs> of course. Naturally, it'll take time, but... Uh... We interrupt this program to bring you a special news report. At 10, 20, 35 this morning, New York Harbor Police found the body of the missing financier, John Winthrop, <gasps> in the Hudson River off 54th Street. The dead man had been shot in the head, and the police believe he was murdered. They are looking for his wife, Mrs. Vivian Winthrop, and Jerome Norton, her brother, for questioning. For further details, listen in on our regular news period at... Jerry... How could they have found him? How could they? I tied those weights securely, but somehow the body must have slipped out of the ropes and come to the surface. Jerry, what are we going to do? You heard what that announcer said. The police are looking for us. Yes, I know. And once they take our fingerprints, it'll be the end. They'll learn about New Orleans and that, that we aren't brother and sister. Well, Jerry, we just can't stay here. We've got to run for it before they catch us. Run? Where can we run oh, to? I don't know. Mexico, South America, any place. We have my jewels. They're worth over $100,000. Yes, but what good are they? What we need is cash, and all I have with me is $300. If we don't dare go to your bank, they'd pick us up immediately. Oh, I'm sure there's some place we'll be able to sell my jewelry. I'll pack my things at once. Vivian, there's no sense in running away. How far do you think we'd get? The police are probably on their way here already. Jerry, what's wrong with you? We've got to run away. There's no other way out. There is another way out. If we're willing to take it. What way is that? The easiest and simplest way out of all troubles, darling. Suicide? Oh, no, Jerry, no. Would you rather go to the chair? Or even worse, be sentenced to life imprisonment? Life imprisonment? Oh, no, I couldn't stand that. Don't you see, darling, we have no choice. We're gamblers who played for high stakes and, and lost. Oh, Jerry, I'm afraid. I'm so afraid. It's better than rotting behind bars for the rest of our lives. Don't you agree with me, darling? Oh, I know you're right, Jerry, but... I don't want to die. I want to live. So do I, Vivian, but... Do you hear sirens? Jerry, the police. They're here already. Yes. A police car and two motorcycle police are coming up the road. 
They'll be here in a minute or two. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, what are we going to do? We have the choice of going back with them and standing trial for murder, or the other. You know what my choice is. Huh? How are you going to do it? Poison tablets. I have them here. I've carried them a long time against just such a moment as this. Will, will we suffer much? No, darling. A moment or two, then it will be all over. The police are almost here. We haven't much time. All right, Jerry. Yeah, now you're being the good loser that I always knew you were. Here's a tablet for you, darling. And one for me. Will one be enough? Yes, more than enough. Don't be afraid, Vivian. Do it quickly without thinking about it. Here, here, I'll take mine first. Oh. Now, you take yours. All right, Jerry. That's it. There, that wasn't so hard, was it? No. Well, darling, they're here. But nothing they can do or say can matter to us anymore. We've beaten them, do you understand? They can't touch us. Yes, Jerry. I'll let them in now. Hello, Lieutenant. Come in, come in. You remember Mrs. Winthrop, don't you? You can stop the acting, Norton, or should I say Gordon? We know who you and Mrs. Winthrop are. Oh, so you've already found out, huh? Yes. We did some fast checking this morning after Winthrop's body was fished out of the harbor. I'm going to have to take you both back to headquarters. I'm afraid you're a little late, Lieutenant. A little late? Yes. You see, a minute or so before you arrived, my wife and I took poison tablets. Huh? In a very little while, we'll both be well out of your reach. Rogan, get the first aid kit from the squad car. Yes, sir. You're wasting your time, Lieutenant. You're never going to send us to prison for John Winthrop's murder? Murder? We don't want you for Winthrop's murder. You don't want us for John's murder? No, for the simple reason he wasn't murdered. What? What are you saying? I shot and killed him myself. You only think you did. An autopsy this morning showed that John Winthrop died of heart failure. All you did was put a bullet into a corpse about an hour later. You mean... You mean he was already dead... Dead when I shot him? Yes, that's right. Lieutenant... Help us. Don't let us... Jerry, I, I can't breathe. I, help me. I... Oh. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, don't let us die. Save us. Save us. Don't... Well... Lieutenant, get the first aid kit. It's too late, Gregor. You mean they did? Yes. The chief only wanted them for questioning, but if ever two people deserved to die, they did. There was murder in their hearts. Yet I'll be doggone if the law would have been able to do anything to them. We couldn't have held them for murder. Yeah, that's right. It would have been hard to make a charge of bigamy stick with Winthrop dead. I guess about the only thing we could have held them for was mutilation and illegal transportation of a corpse. Yes, sir. Uh, justice sure has a strange way of working itself out. And so ends the tale. You only die once. As it is written in the sealed book. The uncanny hand of fate reached out for the two who had ruthlessly planned the death of an innocent man. And doomed them to die through their own actions. And now, keeper of the book, before you close the great volume... Show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. A weird and magic tale of a strange life and an even stranger death. And of a murder terrible beyond all belief. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan.